Hi everyone, thanks for coming back and joining me for another video. So, last week, very, very stressful. I won't bore you with the details, but basically I lost my cool. And uh, then I decided to make matters worse for myself because I lost my temper when I had my phone in my hand. <laughs> and you can guess what happened, just donk. So um, I've got a slightly broken screen. It doesn't seem to be affecting the camera, so I am going to use this for as long as I can. For those of you that don't know how I film my YouTube videos, there is no expensive equipment. I film myself on my iPhone and I have a little ring light in the background for £15 off of Amazon that just gives me that bit of a healthier glow. But otherwise, yeah, it's not really that technical and you don't need to spend a fortune, those of you that are thinking about doing it. But don't have your phone in your hand when stuff doesn't work. So as I said, I've, I've now got to find the time and, um, and the inclination to go pay £200 because iPhone screens are not cheap. But lesson learned. So the title of this video, How Low Can They Go? Well, it would seem that they can go lower than probably even they thought. The Royal website has been updated and the newspapers are obviously stirring the pot. They've been snubbed, they've been demoted, they have been cruelly pushed further down the line. Not as far as we'd like because that would be off the page. But what has happened is they have found themselves um, put under all of the work in Royals. That's what it comes down to. It's not a personal swipe at Harry and Meghan's decisions or anything they've done but they are no longer working royals so personally as I said I don't think they should be on there anyway but what is embarrassing is literally Prince Andrew is the lowest you can go and they are one above him they are behind even the 65th in line to the throne yes um I'm sure that is involving some flying saucepans over in Montecito for sure. But yes, they found themselves even lower than the Duke and Duchess of Gloucestershire and the Duke of Kent. Now, not everyone has been lucky enough to stay on the list and that is Prince Michael of Kent and his wife, Princess Michael of Kent. They have found themselves completely removed from the list. That is because they have um, retired effectively. But yes, people are stirring up the pot a little bit, but it is kind of funny to see Harry and Meghan demoted that far low down the food chain. But it's always been their decisions and their choices, so you'd think that they wouldn't care, but I'm pretty sure they do. But before I get started on the Montecito mayhem, the dynamic duo of doom, <laughs> That's probably a bit extreme. But before I start talking about them and Valentine Lowe's book, let's talk about William and Catherine, the Prince and Princess of Wales, who, given the fact that that is their title, have recently gone back to visit Wales. They have done a 24-hour trip. They stopped off at Anglesey, which was actually the first place they set up a family home. We had lots of pictures years ago of the young couple walking hand in hand with then Lupo, their dog, which is sadly now part past, you know, making a lot of memories as the young couple they were. And time absolutely flies. They are now obviously parents of three lovely children that I'm sure and I hope are enjoying their new school. So Anglesey was the first pit stop for the couple. They visited the RNLI in Holyhead, which is one of the oldest lifeboat stations that opened in 1828. Over the course of the years since it was opened, they have received 70 awards for bravery and gallantry. And I can only imagine the amount of lives that they have saved. So the couple went and met with locals plus various organisations, but no one was more excited than this little star called Theo Crompton, whose excited little face lit up and it's one of the purest things that I've seen in a while absolutely adorable. He was so excited to meet Princess Catherine and she obviously felt the same. Catherine and William took the time to speak to the little boy but oh he just absolutely adorable. So on from Anglesey the royal couple went and visited a church in Swansea which supports people locally and provides services such as a food bank, facilities for the homeless which helps provide them food, showers, uh, there's a community training kitchen and various other things that help bring the community together and supporting each other especially the hardship that a a lot of people have gone through in the last few years with the lockdowns. Catherine was then seen with another adorable little girl dressed in a traditional Welsh dress who gave her a cuddle, some flowers and then also helped Catherine pick out some donations for Swansea Baby Basics which helps vulnerable mothers. Now Catherine, you've probably have heard of Baby Basics before, Catherine has worked with them for a number of years with the Royal Foundation. She was part of a drive to get 19 British brands to donate over 10,000 items to more than 40 baby banks nationwide. The way that Catherine... <laughs> 
and indeed William here, as we can see from the photographs, interact with children. You can really see why she's being called the children's princess. She absolutely loves them. William does as well. They've just got this natural vibe with them and the way that children react to them. I've always said this with children. Children know. Children and animals know. <laughs> And they obviously get the seal of approval from, I'd say, 99% of the children that they meet. So let's talk about the Montecito drama llamas. They have naturally got a lot on their plate at the moment. Whilst people say, leave them alone, leave them to lead their life in peace. I wish that they would leave us to leave our life <laughs> alone in peace. Megan's Archetypes podcast is uh, being, you know, released again on the 4th of October. There was lots of rumours saying that she was going to have to try and refilm and get them to cut a lot of the stuff out because Megan can't help herself. She was bound to bash the royal family, the monarchy. So that's going to be, I would say, interesting to hear, but I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to read about it in the newspapers because I just can't put myself through that anymore. Now, in the next story, Megan, surprisingly, is coming back to the UK to collect an award. Of course she is. So I don't know what's more bizarre about this. Megan is getting an award for her charity works, which, you know, are legendary by now. Or the fact that the award is actually being given by GQ Men of the Year Awards. So I find that really bizarre because she's a woman, surely, you know, the, the Men of the Year Awards goes to the Men of the Year. I'm clearly out of touch what is actual charity in the fashion world elite. So obviously we have seen certain things from Megan, haven't we? We've seen the $25 donation that she made, a Starbucks donation. Then we had Megan's own turn on like the Baby Basics. She um, gave some diapers, uh, nappies in the UK. Sorry, that's Americanisms where I'm spending so much time reading American stuff. But yes, yeah, she handed over bunches of nappies which were actually donated to Archwell by Procter and Gamble. You know, Procter and Gamble, the story that Megan wrote to them when she was blah, 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 and she got the soap commercial canceled. Yes, those people that she decided to partner with. Isn't it funny that they seem to get freebies off of people that they partner with, such as awards. We had the NAACP. Funnily enough, Megan and Harry are there to pick up their award, but they've just partnered with them so they can hand out their own award every year. What about the pose pictures that they had when they went to feed the needy and the poor? Or what about the fact when they turned up to a school drive? Do you remember they were handing out packages through car windows? Megan posed with her hair down and then the photographer quickly got her to change it and tie her hair up. It was also reported all across social media for people that were there. They did not spend time talking to the workers, the people that did the hard work. They turned up very quickly with a couple of staff members. They posed for photographs and they were gone. This has also happened across various other little charity drives that they've done. They go there and they almost get the credit for organising it when, if anything, they just got their pictures taken. We also had them making a donation through Archwell to help the Afghanistan women. It was obviously kept secret for the first time ever as to how much they donated, but then funnily enough, they were then recognised for their outstanding charitable efforts and were given an award for humanitarianism. Hmm, I'm beginning to see a pattern here. Money award. Now, that being said, they've not partnered with GQ, but naturally you think, well, there's going to be a connection with GQ, isn't there? And GQ is owned by Cond Nast. Now, Cond Nast owns a lot of magazines, including Vogue. So British UK Vogue is actually headed up by the editor-in-chief, Edward Eninful, who just happens to be friends with Meghan. But he's also friends with Marcus Anderson. And uh, yeah, you can see that link again, can't you? Marcus Anderson's always there somewhere, isn't he? And uh, also, Contenas, a lot of the magazines that they do, they work very closely with Oprah. So again, oh, there's another link. So I still, I'm really beginning to think that Oprah is managing Meghan behind the scenes. Plus, if we look at who GQ have awarded Women of the Year awards to, um, yeah, that, that's say no more. Now back to the title, How Low They Can Go, let's talk about Valentine Lowe's book, Courtiers, The Hidden Power Behind the Crown. I have only read what the newspapers have released, and I'll be honest, it's not particularly flattering. And it further confirms everything that Tom Bauer had said about Meghan bullying staff. When the book does come out, I'm going to obviously read it like I did Tom Bauer and then I will do a video, but I will make sure that I don't ruin the book for you because I always encourage people to buy the books and read it themselves. But yes, for the short few bits that have been released, I can imagine that there are plenty of plates being smashed in Montecitos as well as saucepans flying around. Duck Harry! 
Now, some of the stuff has come out involves Meghan and Harry screaming at staff, berating them literally hourly. There was one poor member of staff that was quoted saying they went out to dinner. They were not in work hours. And Meghan and Harry rang them every hour. They had to leave their dinner, go outside and speak to them and be screamed at. Ruined their evening quite clearly, but then also continued the attacks the next day. So they literally, once they get a bee in their bonnet and you've done something wrong, they'll keep going and going and going and going. And that's, that is more than bullying that is why people have said you know it was mental torture working for them there are quotes in the book from long time royal members of staff samantha cohen and uh, she worked for the royal family i think 19 years the queen specifically so you know the queen of england she um she knows her stuff and she said it was like working for teenagers they were never happy nothing was ever good enough especially for Meghan. a lot of the palace staff were railroaded steamed over and it's just truly shocking behavior the two adults can behave like this but even more shocking that they were allowed to behave like this and this is something that I really do hope that the palace have um, definitely changed a lot of their policies because no one no matter where you work should be treated by anyone no matter who they are like that. So one of the quotes says, uh, those that worked with her came to be so disillusioned that they began to suspect that even her most heartfelt pleas for help were part of a deliberate strategy that had one end in sight her departure from the royal family. Now, I, like many people, have always said, I don't believe that she ever wanted to fit in. I believe that she has always, always been calculated with this. I believe that the whole thing was the ultimate historical smash and grab, cash and carry that the royal family had seen. That's why she managed to <laughs> steamroll her over them because it just happened so quick and so fast. But Harry was behind every step of Meghan's behaviour and enabling it. And because they enabled Harry, in a way, they, they let Meghan get away with what they did. And the worst bit of it is Meghan gets to play victim in all of this. But this is where these two books are blowing it all apart. Another courtier was quoted, the mistake they made was thinking she wanted to be happy. She wanted to be rejected because she was obsessed with that narrative from day one. Of course she was, because she had to leave some sort of paper trail how she was treated, how she was a victim. She did it from day one, which is just ridiculous when everyone can remember the engagement interview of, I'm going to hit the ground running. Everyone's been so welcoming. Everyone's been so lovely to me. Everyone's amazing. And now they're all racist awful people, part of an institute that wanted to kill me and my unborn baby. Hmm. As I said, I believe that everything was always calculated, premeditated to carry out the con of the century. There will be books written about Meghan after the divorce. Now, this has been further proved by the book by Valentine Lowe, and that is the fact that Meghan has been caught saying on multiple occasions that she couldn't believe she's been forced to meet the public and not be paid for it. It was all about money. It was always about cold, hard cash. She had grown up being, <laughs> tried to be a celebrity where you got paid for signing books, you got paid for appearances. She couldn't believe, despite the fact she had a life of luxury in front of her, she couldn't handle shaking people's hands and saying hello to people in crowds because it was beneath her not getting a paycheck for it. That tells you everything about it. And this is why I also have my suspicions about Archwell being more of a bank account than I do a genuine charitable foundation where she wants to be a humanitarian and help people. I believe, like many foundations that are set up, it is about helping someone and that's Megan. You have got the royal family when she joined, you have got the, the people that work for them then that were part of um, Sussex Royal, they now call themselves the Sussex Survivors Club. And when you now see Archwell, the number of staff that have left, look at this. This has been a very short space of time. And these are just the high flyers that you would hear about. What about all of the admin staff and all the other people that have no doubt left? I am in no doubt that they still have a revolving door of staff. Now, one of the things that people have said to me on social media and sometimes in the comments, they're like, well, why would you believe Valentine Lowe? Why do you believe Tom Bauer? It's very simple, really. In fact, I've got three reasons. Um, the first one is Harry and Meghan haven't sued Valentine Lowe, who broke the story a few years ago. I think that the staff have been given permission to speak to Valentine Lowe. No one in the royal family would risk losing their jobs. They have very strict non-disclosure agreements and the same that I can't see that he would ever lie about it for the simple fact that he could get sued. The same with Tom Bauer. They're not stupid. They're both investigative reporters. They've got a lot of history and a, lot, a large career under their belts. So yes, I believe them. 
Secondly, talking of the staff, think about the number of state banquets, Commonwealth visits, diplomats visiting, royal visiting, jubilee celebrations for the Queen. I mean, the Queen going abroad and royal tours as well as um, Prince, well, now King Charles, but when it was Prince Charles, all of the garden parties, everything that they have organised and they have thrown for years. And you're telling me that the moment that they worked for a cable TV actress, that they suddenly became lazy, inept, that they couldn't handle pressure, work into deadlines, work into timelines you're telling me that these members of staff that have spent years decades working for the queen for king charles for princesses william and harry all of a sudden when they got a ex cable tv actress in there they suddenly needed to be coddled it doesn't make sense does it and then thirdly, the main thing here, there is a pattern. The moment that Meghan joined the royal family, um, rumours started, arguments, infighting was beginning to happen. There were arguments of um, demands. The royal foundation, Meghan joined it, they split up. Harry and Meghan were going to move into Kensington Palace next to William and Catherine, they got hoofed out. Staff quit prestigious royal positions that had worked for the royal family for years, experienced staff like i just said there are lots of them that worked for the queen underneath the queen directly for prince charles now king charles and they quit the same as i said has continued with archwell there is a revolving door of staff i mean the fact that catherine william and the queen well, i know catherine and, and the queen definitely did they had to tell megan to stop talking to their staff Badly. Meghan got told off by Catherine for having a go at her nanny, Prince George's nanny, Maria. And then the Queen herself caught Meghan talking to a member of her kitchen staff like a piece of crap and she had to tell her off. Bearing in mind that Meghan came from a modest background, you know? And even if she didn't, you don't speak to people like that. Then you come to Meghan's family. It's not just her dad and her siblings that are no longer in her life. She's cut off her entire family, both sides. She has cut every single member of them off. And more recently, two of her uncles died. One helped her get a job when she worked briefly in Argentina and the other one just was part of her life growing up. Both sides of the family, a Ragland and then a Markle, and she's never even so much as rang her family, rang her aunt. Her aunt said about she'd never even heard from Meghan after he died. This is telling you everything, how you treat your family. And then obviously she's cut off the family that she never had and has Harry, but that's on Harry. You can't blame Meghan for Harry doing that, although I do think she is the little, the little worm in his ear, chewing up the last of his brain that was there. But even when you look back at all of the people that have spoken about Meghan, unless they're on Meghan's payroll or they're on Sunshine Sachs' payroll or Oprah's payroll, it's never complimentary, is it? Childhood friends, I mean, ex-partners you can count because how many of us would have an ex-partner that would say something nice? But it's uh, colleagues, people that have worked for her when she was just in suits, videographers, people that have interviewed her, family, friends, um, people that she went to school with, and it's never flattering. You can't tell me that all of these people have all got a vendetta. Meghan and Meghan's fan base always make her out to be a victim, but there are far too many people from all different walks of life that have all had their dealings with her. There is one common denominator in all of this, and she is no doubt wearing a ball gown, marching around her garden in Montecito, screaming that she's a princess to the world. <laughs> so that's it for me, guys, on this video, and I'll be back with you very soon. Take care for now. Bye. If you would like to buy me a coffee, please go to my about page and click the link. Love, Taz.